Ladies and gentlemen, a long awaited video, SoFi versus Nubank, which one might be the best investment for you? In full disclosure, I hold both of these companies and there's good things and bad even past what I'm about to show you. But that being said, I had brought together all of the most important information that you need to see for these two companies right here in this small Excel spreadsheet. So without further ado, if you like these sort of videos, make sure you guys hit the like button. But aside from that, let's jump into it. So here it is, SoFi Technologies versus New Holdings. As you can tell, in the blue blue columns right here, we are going to be holding SoFi's numbers. And then in the purple columns, we are going to be holding Nubank's numbers. And going as far back as Nubank can go is only Q2 of 2021. So although I have earlier numbers for SoFi, it's not the case for Nubank. So to keep it even, that's as far back as we'll go. Where right now we can see customer numbers are, you know, <laughs> very, very different. You know, at the end of Q4 2022, Nubank had almost 14.2 times the amount of uh, over overall customers that they have versus SoFi, but this is actually down from over 16 times, so SoFi in a way is actually starting to gain on them. But that being said, if Nubank can't continue to keep up these growth rates, obviously SoFi will start to gain a good presence there, but for now Nubank takes the cake on customer count. But now whenever we look at the revenue column versus the actual customer count, what we can see is that the overall revenue is growing, but not nearly as fast as new banks, where the revenue growth is just absolutely insane. Holding up back in the, you know, the early quarters of 2021, you can see revenue growth of in the high to 30 to even 40% growths, where we just never saw those high numbers in SoFi, not even reaching uh, upwards of 20%, which would just be sort of below the average for new bank. This means that the average revenues for SoFi and Nubank have absolutely spread apart. Back before, Nubank only had about 145% of what uh, SoFi's revenue is. Now it's at 320% and continues to climb quarter after quarter. Green smoothie break. Okay, let's jump back into it. Back in Q2 of 2021, whenever Nubank was at $336 million worth of revenue, it took to Q1 of 2022 for SoFi to hit that. They didn't even hit it at that time. And then on their next quarter for Nubank, they went up to 480 million just by the next quarter. SoFi still hasn't hit that quarters later. We're, we're about to go into a full year round before we can even get to what, you know, Nubank got in the next quarter. You know, multiply that sort of growth rate over many quarters and we're already, you know, over a billion dollars more in our earnings than what SoFi is seeing. But now combining the two, looking at revenue per member, what we can see is that SoFi has sort of stayed in this exact same space, actually lowering a little bit from $90 over to $87.44. This is mainly because because our growth of our financial services clients have way outweighed, you know, the more profitable lending side of the category. And so it's great that we have all these new customers, but you know, we sort of lower the amount that we're actually earning per customer. And so that's sort of what you're seeing in these growth rates, a little bit of a decline overall, but we're still a lot of money per customer. New bank doesn't get anywhere near the level of monetization per member, but that being said, the growth rates per member is absolutely stunning. Q2 of 2021, $8, all the way up to Q4 2022, almost $20, right? And then that does make a big difference whenever you look at the ratio between the two of them. The gap is closing quickly. You know, SoFi used to have over a 10X on the amount, almost, or over 11X on the amount of revenue per member. Now that's down to a 4.5X, which is still a lot, but if the trend continues, you know, New Bank might be able to get the same amount of revenue per customer but you know, maybe not have to pay for them. And that's sort of where we see customer acquisition costs. This is where things get extremely interesting. As you can see that SoFi's customer acquisition costs have been extremely high and growing over time, right? And then I also did another metric here that we're actually comparing the customer acquisition costs to the average revenue per user as a ratio, right? So we can actually see how effective it is that we're actually spending this much money. And it seems like as we're actually going down, you know, and, and our also our average revenue per user, users also going down, that the effectiveness of spending this much is actually losing its sort of strength, right? Now we're only getting about a 25%, you know, ratio whenever it comes to our quarterly revenue per member. Whereas Nubank is the complete opposite here. Actually unbelievable. They have some of the lowest customer acquisition costs in the entire globe of financial technology services companies, 
And e even though I actually calculate this much more aggressively than they do, um, but it's the same equation for both SoFi and Nubank, I'm just sort of taking the entire sales and marketing spend and then looking at that, dividing it across, you know, all their new customer ads. But that being said, whenever they do spend $12.17 per user, they're actually getting more than what they actually spent in that immediate quarter at over 160%, right? And this is actually way, way down from 250% or 280% just a couple of quarters ago. So they are really the true kings of monetizing a very cheap client. So then we actually have to look at two other metrics that I have brought up here. CAC difference, which is customer acquisition cost, and the difference between them, meaning that Nubank only spends almost 1% of the customer acquisition cost of what SoFi would spend back in Q2 of 2021. Today's numbers, Q4 2022, we're actually spending, or Nubank spending around 3.5% of what SoFi would be spending, which is, you know, it's growing. We're actually starting to spend more at Nubank, but SoFi, you know, we are really going after more of an affluent member there. And so it's a little bit of a different story, right? It's a a little bit of a picture between red oceans and blue oceans, right? United States is so full of fintech companies that it's extremely expensive to go after customers that are getting applied to by, you know, all sorts of different companies. Whereas Nubank is really the biggest player in the market in Latin America, and there's not many other players, so we can kind of just offer our product and people take it for free. That is, you know, 80 to 90% of their new customer ads are organic signups. But then that leads us to this ultimate number, customer acquisition costs versus average revenue per user efficacy, where you can actually see that the percentage at which, so, or, you know, the spend that Nubank is actually putting out versus the amount of revenue that they can actually bring in is almost at, you know, in Q1 of 2022, 11 times more effective. Actually, even going into Q4 2022, still over six times more effective per dollar than what SoFi is doing. But that still doesn't mean, you know, everything. How much are we spending for this company? How much are we actually bringing to the bottom line? And this is sort of where net incomes come into as well. Now, this is the net income where you can see that both of these companies are large losers, okay? In terms of that's how much their burn rate is. Large, large, you know, spends. And then the actual net difference between their revenue to their actual spend. What you want is to actually get to that 100% or above. That's when you know that you've hit profitability, right? And so what you can actually see is that Nubank has actually been quite effective at staying very high in the 90 percentile, even closer than SoFi has ever been, you know, for all of their quarters, but still in the negative. So they're still in a little bit of a burn rate, but that being said, it is staying in a close range so they can manage their actual burn rates. And then in these last two quarters, they have actually broken profitability. Now, I will say that the CEO, David Valise, actually says that this is not going to be the case forever and that the actual spend in Nubank might actually go back into the negatives as they want to continue to try to, you know, expedite the process of growing quicker and quicker. So they really just want to maintain growth and that's going to cost a lot of money. So don't expect this net revenue to stay in the positives forever, but for now it does look good. Valuation sort of gets us to assess what's the assumed growth rate going forward, because if that's already priced into the stock, then we might not be getting any sort of deal. This is when I bring you to this page, the valuation page, where you can see first off, the market cap between SoFi and Nubank are completely different. Nubank is almost four times more expensive than SoFi for a company that at one point was actually very similar whenever it came to revenues and net incomes. On a forward PE ratio, these numbers were actually snagged from Google Finance, where it's actually saying that SoFi's forward PE is non-existent. However, that shouldn't be the case because like they said, in Q4 2023 is when we're actually expecting income, which means 2024 should be an actual year of full profitability. But that being said, Nubank is the same thing as well, where they think that we're actually going to reach a 64 times forward PE, which is quite expensive. And you can see that whenever we look at things like price to sales and price to book, where you're almost spending twice the amount from, you know, for Nubank than you would be for SoFi or almost whenever it comes to price to book, look at the difference, right? You're almost spending 5X how much the company is actually worth on a net asset value or its net worth overall versus how much you would spend for SoFi technologies. But this has not deterred insiders or even institutions. Whenever you look at the difference here, insiders actually hold more of new bank than SoFi, even though, you know, CEO Anthony Noto has been buying, but institutions, this is where you see a massive difference, right? 30 
36% holding whenever it comes to SoFi technologies is actually, you know, quite low. That means that the majority of the people that are holding this company are retail investors like you and I, whereas the majority of this company, especially between insiders and institutions is almost exclusively all professional money management. And the same thing goes for the other side. Almost 9% of SoFi technologies is being held on a short side and people are betting against the company, which is not extremely high. I mean, it's been almost double that, you know, in previous years or has been double that last year, but only less than 2% of new bank, which is practically non-existent under 2% is practically no shorts at all. That is absolutely, you know, mind blowing to know that no one really wants to bet against David Velez and his team. And then to put a cherry on top of all of this, their total cash in debts are the complete opposite. SoFi is holding less cash than debt, which is normal for a growing company, but new bank is something special. Even though they are a growing company, they're still very much in the net profitability side in terms of their, you know, cash to debt. They could pay off all of their debt right now, be debt free and still have a large amount of cash on hand in case, you know, they want to grow even more. Now, if I were to point out the most important numbers out of anything on this actual chart, the two most important numbers are price to sales and price to book. Most importantly, price to book ratio, especially whenever we're trying to judge banks. But that being said, that's a massive price to pay for new bank, especially whenever you consider that 97% or whatever of their overall customer base is in Brazil. And yet they already own over 44% of the overall adult population as customers. So how can you keep up these large growth rates and these anticipated growth rates through price to book and price to sales and all of these things if, for example, we're almost running out of customers. Whereas whenever you look at SoFi, it's so much easier for them to get from 5 million to 75 million customers versus a company going from 75 million and trying to get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of users. As you actually start to get larger, it gets way harder to keep up these growth rates. And you have to remember that whenever you're buying fractional parts of companies, that's what you're paying for is the growth rates to continue. The truth is I'm gonna be buying these companies for completely different reasons. SoFi has the customer growth that can continue to happen and the total addressable market is absolutely massive. Latin America is much smaller than the United States and the total addressable market that Nubank currently could actually take over is much smaller than SoFi's. Also with Latin America, you also have to get around a lot of the international risks as well, where if you know something were to happen that maybe wasn't a part of the United States, you would not have control of this. And you know things like inflation rates in Argentina, if we were already in Argentina, which is expected to happen, that could massively affect you know certain parts of the business. Like our debt products, credit cards, and loans, and these sorts of things would be heavily affected on the downside versus interchange fees and these sorts of things would be very much on the upside. Having a company that's actually, you know, surrounded in the reserve currency of the world is a massive benefit to SoFi's and one that's very hard to price in. But I went way more in depth on the total addressable market on New Bank in this video right here. So make sure you guys go check that out. But aside from that, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Have a great day. Bye for now.